Welcome to another episode of The Theater Podcast. I'm Alan Seals. I'm Jillian Hockman. This is intimate, personal conversations with theater's biggest names. And this episode you're about to hear is with relative Broadway newbie uh, Noah J. Ricketts. Um, and I say relative because, well, he's this is his second Broadway credit, um, Beautiful the Musical being the first. Now he is playing Kristoff in Frozen. And Jillian, we just got out of the interview. Uh, what did you think about it? It was a great interview. Noah's adorable. <laughs> Love him. Um, no, I was really impressed that he is he is a relative newbie to Broadway, but he is really good and really professional. And he was originally the understudy for Kristoff, and it's pretty rare that they have an understudy move into the principal role, um, which he talks about. You'll have to listen and hear more about it. Uh, so I was I was really impressed with his professionalism and like how well he kind of knew himself and and knows how to to play the role really well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. He he seems he presents himself, uh, I guess, as, as an old soul. You know, to to overuse a phrase that's often used, um, but to to that respect too. Um, in the interview, we got into into something that surprised me about the audition process, and he said there were, it was like a full week of. Of callback after callback and, yeah, and dance all the call, workshops dance and everything. Workshops and and it was incredible the amount of work that Disney put into casting this thing in, initially in the first place because there was a lot of pressure I suspect and he even he mentioned this a little bit to get the show just right mm-hmm. to to match the the critical acclaim that that is the movie. Yeah, if you're putting if you're putting that name on it, you better do it right. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I think they nailed it, and uh, and he does a wonderful job in the show. Yeah. Um, so yeah, everybody, please enjoy this episode with Noah J. Ricketts. Here you go. One, two, three. This triple threat got his start in Kentucky before landing roles in Broadway and the touring productions of Beautiful, the Carol King musical, and he holds regional credits such as Hello Dolly, Lacage, Tarzan, and Dreamgirls. Now currently playing Kristoff in Frozen, the musical on Broadway, Noah J. Ricketts. Thank you for being on the podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Do I have to call you Noah J. Ricketts or Noah Ricketts? You know, usually people, this is how I know where people know me from. Because when I was in high school, people used to call me Noah James. In college, they called me No-No. And in New York, they usually call me Noah J. So I, I know where I know people from along my lifeline via what they call me. Oh, that's interesting. I've, I, yeah, I've got a friend, uh, Chris, who somehow, ironically, that I'm talking to someone from Frozen. Before Frozen came out, mm-hmm. I did a show with him where we made up fake German characters. <laughs> and so he went by Olaf. Oh, really? And so now he's like, oh, darn you, Frozen. He, like, So he goes by Olaf now, and I, but I still call him Chris. He will oh. always be Chris to me. So yes, right. I hear that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're from Kentucky. Tell me about where you grew up. Yeah, so I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Derby City. It's probably what we're best known for, and bourbon, of course. Right. Yeah, and it's like, I don't know, like I get, when I'm in New York and I tell people I'm from Kentucky, I get a lot of strange stares because apparently I don't really have an accent anymore. Not at all, no. Yeah, and I think that's a product of theater school, (laughs) many, many years of theater school. But yeah, I grew up in Kentucky. When I first was there, I did not like it at all, like at all. Um, I always dreamed of the big city, and I know that sounds kind of cliche and cheesy, but I always dreamed of like being in a big city and like doing big things. And so little old Kentucky was not doing it for me. Now that I'm older, I appreciate it much more. But back then, I didn't like it at all. What's the? This is, shows my ignorance of geography. What's the closest like major city to Louisville? Major city or like state? Major city. Well, the the biggest. Well, Frankfurt is the capital, right? Uh, Louisville is the biggest city there. Lexington. There's a couple of them, I would say. Or major city like Nashville is not too far away. Cincinnati, Ohio is about an hour and well, thirty Na- minutes. Yeah, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm trying to think of like, yeah, when I think Kentucky, this is the city I think of, and I can't. Sorry, Kentucky. I, I know. Just, I just can't. I, know. I can't place anything. <laughs> it's all right. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. But yeah. Yep, Kentucky through and through. So but, yeah. But, now that I'm older, I appreciate it. I do like Kentucky now. I'm kind of the same way. I, I'm from a tiny part of North Carolina, and growing up in North Carolina, I was like, Ugh, you know. Yeah. And then I enjoy going back and visiting. Yeah. But definitely, I'm glad I'm living <laughs> here in this wonderful city. Same. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Your bio, uh, your bio in Frozen says for grandma. Tell me about your relationship. Oh, with your grandma. Yeah, my relationship with my grandma is a good one. Um, it's really funny because she's from France. She was born in Orléans, France, so she has a very thick French accent. And so, um, 
she's been like a rock throughout my whole career, my whole life. She's told me to like, you know, pursue my dreams and do what I want to do. And she's the person that depended on when I wasn't doing well or when I was struggling in terms of like, you know, getting into schools maybe or like uh, with parts or roles or whatever. And she was always the person to be like, no, keep going, keep fighting, you can do this. And so that's why I write in there for grandma. And it, uh, were your parents a product of your life growing up too? Or, or just you, we, your grandma, your immediate family was all there? Yeah, they were all there. Um, you know, I'm the only one in my family that does anything in relation to the arts, like anything at all. And I've tried to like, trace my like lineage to see if there was like a distant singer or dancer <laughs> or, or truly anything and there isn't so I can't say that they fully understood it at all times but they definitely um, supported me in doing whatever it was I wanted to do that made me happy so that's really good that's nice yeah yeah are you are you an only child too or do you have siblings no I have a brother and I have a sister they're both older than me so I'm the baby of the family and uh, my sister is a teacher uh, elementary school teacher and my brother um, runs uh, apartment complexes in Kentucky. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. So. Totally not performing. Totally not, not performing. Not at totally all. Totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they they love it. They appreciate it. So that's really great. And it, well, you 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 do a little bit of teaching too, right? Um, and mm-hmm. we'll get into this a little bit more, but you you traveled a little bit and have done some teaching. Right? Yeah, I have. I have. Um, I work with this wonderful organization called the Broadway Dreams Foundation. Right. And um, so with them, I've been able to travel all over the United States, but also internationally teaching. And I think the craziest place I've ever gone teaching that they took me was Moscow, Russia. Yeah. So I went there for two and a half weeks with them um, on a venture through the Russian government, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Paid through the Russian government to teach them musical theater. And it was a really wonderful and eye-opening experience to see how our cultures actually aligned in a lot of ways and um, how they wanted to really, they were really hungry for knowledge about musical theater because living in the United States and living in America, we forget that this is our art form, that Mm -hmm. we created it and we established it and we know how to do it, but they, you know, best. And so it was nice to teach them ways to like interpret material and, uh, and show them and introduce them to new types of material like Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen and contemporary stuff as well. Yep. Wow. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask what, what you actually taught them over there. Like, did they know about Hamilton and Dear Evan Hansen and these other shows when you were teaching them? Like, like has it made it? Is that kind of stuff like totally global? Yeah, actually. So when we went over there, we had to um, t- uh, talk about the shows that we wanted to work on when we were there because we had a presentation at the end. And um, we brought that stuff up. We're like, you know, this is what's happening over here. Like, it'd be cool to bring it over there. And they're like, oh, no, it won't sell. It won't sell. So they pressed shows like Oliver and Annie. And we were like, "Uh, I mean, those are great and all, but we've got some new stuff as well. And so we really had a lot of pushback, but we fought for what we wanted and we ended up winning. And we had to, they had to submit audition videos before we ever got to Russia. And one of the, in the packet was, I think it was like Hamilton's rap. Not even sure which one, but it was a full on rap. And we got so many videos of people going for it, like really? thick Russian ac- accents and all. And it was pretty inspiring to see that they were like willing to put in the work and figuring it out. I mean, it's hard enough to rap in English right? <laughs> and then to rap, you know, in English but within, and in Russian, you know, like trying to get through that barrier was is even tougher, but they did it. And we ended up adding a whole number in the show that was Hamilton based. So, oh, so you put together a show at the end? We did. It's like a, like a showcase sort of thing? Yeah, it is. And um, we sold out. We sold out both shows. It was There was 3,000 people that attended. It, it was pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah, we had a full, full auditorium uh, between two shows, full orchestra. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. It was a wonderful experience. Well, so you've you've gone up a lot of places with that, and you've been a lot of places domestically, too, with the, with the beautiful tour. Do you have a favorite place that you've been? Mm, in, the, in, in the United States or just well, in general? Okay, give me, a, give me a domestic one and then an international location. Okay. So I would say my favorite place in the U.S. that I've been, I really loved Washington, D.C. Like, I know that's, I really did. Like, I remember driving around with my friend from D.C. in the car, and he played the House of Cards theme song. <laughs> and we were just, like, weaving in and out, like, through the city. And I was like, this is freaking awesome. And I know that's a crazy memory to have, but that's one that I will live on forever because— you know, I love seeing people in suits and the hustle and bustle of it, but also the history of the city and yeah. knowing that like our world is like based around this one massive place. It's pretty awesome, you know, to be in there. So I'd say like that's one of my favorite cities here. And then outside of there, I would say honestly, when I went to St. Petersburg, was pretty awesome. Russia, yeah, Russia yeah. and Russia. It was not Florida, no, not not yeah. Florida, <laughs> different one, not yeah. St. Pete, um, St. Petersburg. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. We went to the Hermitage Museum, which. 
I really underestimated. I knew it was like a giant museum, but you could spend two months in there just seeing things. And so just like seeing their culture and their art and their history displayed all around and like the grand the grand rooms, like gold rooms and red rooms, just colored themed rooms with, you know, chandeliers and this and that all over was pretty, uh, pretty spectacular. So, Do you think that's kind of a... a- like decorating rooms like that is like a lost art form here in the U.S. Because oh I, I, I toured the Buckingham Palace. Yeah. In last time I was in London, and it's just like the estate rooms is just, and, and the art collection is just room after room after room of this these gold gold outlines and pictures. And, yeah. And everything these big priceless vases all over. Oh the my place. god! Everywhere, and it takes it literally yeah. takes your breath away. Yeah. And, yeah. And I realized being there for the first time, I was like, the United States is so young. Like, it is just so young. Like, the history that was just in these singular rooms, I'm like, you don't have that here. And also I realized we're so square. (laughs) (laughs) I came back and I was like, everything's so, like, it's a box. Like, everything is a box. All our buildings are boxes. You know, our rooms are boxes. And it was really cool to be in that place and have the rooms go in and out and weave and secret rooms and attics and things like that. So, yeah, I think it's a lost art form, the, the grandiose decoration now we're kind of minimalist over here, I think. It's funny. You said, um, secret rooms, I guess. Yeah, we were built. I mean, we had the Civil War, but and we've, I guess, two world wars since. I'm trying to, my history is not so good. It's about as good as my geography. <laughs> but yeah, like, I guess we, we founded our country after, man, we are off on a tangent right now. No, right? We are off. <laughs> we founded our country uh, without the need to really hide from our oppressors. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's yeah. I didn't even think about that. Like you put things in an all in a whole new perspective for me. Man. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. right? And I went to Spain, and wait till you go to Spain, and you see all the curved shapes, like all the Gaudi shapes. Everything is on a curve. Nothing, nothing is square. So it's just kind of it's interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. I like the influence when it comes over here. Anyway, yeah, back to theater. Okay, Let's theater. See. Yeah. Uh, blah blah blah. Going through my notes. Yeah. So you went to a performing arts boarding school, mm-hmm. right? So you were immersed. It was the Interlochen Arts Academy in Northern Michigan. Yeah. You and Joe Carroll ever talk about Michigan? Oh, you know, I don't think we have. No? I don't think we actually have. He's from Michigan? He is from Michigan, and I knew that, but I don't think we've ever talked about the state of Michigan, which also is one of my favorite states. It's pretty beautiful. Um, But yeah, I went to Interlochen. Um, I got in when I was a senior, so I went just for one year, right, for boarding school, and Mm -hmm. I went there for theater. And I remember it changed my life forever. Like, it truly, Interlochen means between the lakes. And so it truly is this, like, artist retreat between two giant lakes. And so you wake up every day and my my little dorm room was like, I could peek through my baby window and I could see the lake just going on for miles and miles, it seemed like. And it was just such a special place. Like you walk outside, there's beautiful green trees, you hear cellos, people are just playing. Like, oh, so it was more than just musical theater? It was like... Oh my God, you named the art forms. They had theater, dance, um, motion picture arts, which is kind of crazy, like video, you know, videography, directing. Um, visual art, you name it, writing, creative writing, they had it all. And people would just like play violins out in the streets. Like you just hear that on your way to lunch or like between classes. And like you don't realize how special it is until you leave, you know? So it was a really wonderful place. You mean like the sound of ambulances and screaming (laughs) and and honking is not the same sort of... It's a little uh, different. Yeah, a little different back here. Yeah, it's a little different. And so they actually, the school came to New York this year for like some type of alumni lunch and I got invited to speak. And I'm going to go back to the school itself and speak. And it was just such an honor because I that place taught me so much about what I know about theater and acting in general. So to give back and talk to... The now current high school students, one made me feel a little old, but two, I felt very, very honored to do that. So. Oh, so, okay, so that was a boarding school, that was senior year of high school then. Yeah. Okay, so that wasn't college. Yeah, but before okay. that, I went to another performing arts school in Kentucky. They actually have a performing arts school there. Really? Believe it or not. Yep. Called the Youth Performing Arts School. And so I went there for a vocal performance before I ever left and went to boarding school. And that was a whole different experience, you know, like being a, a vo- classical singer for so long. <laughs> So that was awesome too. So it really helped. Um, it was a re- great sounding board for the next thing I was going to do, which was interlocking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how did you get into into singing and performing in theater in the first place? Like, go, go back even farther. How, okay. did, how did you decide to go to the performing arts school? It was like totally, it, I'll give you the short story. It was totally an accident. So I was like way, way, way into soccer when I was like eight, nine. I like loved it. And I did it all the freaking time. I was on so many teams. And so every summer I like would go to this sports camp and it, you just, you know, it was like sports camp. You played all types of sports and all these things. 
And one day, before I was supposed to leave for sports camp, my friend Ashley came over and she had a skateboard. And she was like, let's try this thing. Let's do this thing. And I was like, yeah, let's do this thing. And so I w- got on the skateboard. I went down my steep driveway and I broke my wrist like in t- 10 seconds. Like, oh, no. Yeah. And I like really bad. And so, you know, we had to deal with all of that. And it was still summer. And my mom was like, I have to go to work. Like, you have to go to a camp. And the only place I was taking students <laughs> still was called Broadway Boot Camp. And it was a musical theater summer camp. And they took me. And I... How old were you? I was like eight, I think. Eight oh, or nine. Wow. Yeah. And they they took me into this camp. And like, next thing I know, I have a cast on my, ha- my arm. And I'm like in music rehearsals and singing for the first time and like acting for the first time. And I was... Absolutely obsessed. So you're basically Evan Hansen is with, that, with the cast. Is yeah. That, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that that was me. That was truly me. And so ever since then, I had been hooked. And I was like one of those kids that spent hours on the computer watching YouTube videos of whoever's singing. I also then got into piano. Um, I started taking piano lessons. And I was really into that. I started taking theater stuff privately. I started taking dance. And I like just doing anything related to art, visual art as well. And so then it came time for like high school to come around and it was like that question of like, well, what are you going to do? So were you still playing soccer at all or were you just like, no, screw it? Screw I'm, it. Yeah. Screw it. I'm in this art thing. And, you know, that pressing question, which they always ask is like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't freaking know. Like, I don't know. And so I was like, well, I like to sing and I like to dance and I like to act. Okay, well, I'll just do musical theater because that's the most things I can do in one art form. And so that's exactly what I decided to pursue. And, I, and I've been off ever since. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then you've trained in theater, jazz, ballet, musical theater, dance styles, and, and tap. What Just for those who don't know, mm-hmm. what is theater jazz compared to regular jazz? Oh, well, theater jazz is like, well, it's just, it's story-based movement, you know, like a uh, movement that tells a story through dance. And so, and typical jazz is, you know, typical jazz would be considered like, how do you explain it? More like 70s, like, <laughs> like jazz dance, like Paul Abdul, you know, like jazz. Mm-hmm. So they're just different. I think one just tells a story and one is, is a standard form of dance. Yeah. And, and so why, why so many different styles though? Oh, I mean, it's so important. Like every show requires different things and it's important to be versatile in, in your abilities. And so each one teaches you something different. It's a completely different quality of movement. So I think it's important to kind of study as much as you can. Um, you know, as much as you can and what little time you have to study. So, yeah, that's why so many styles. That's a good, that's a good point. Is, uh, I guess when, yeah, you dropped soccer, you were taking jazz. Do, were you taking any voice lessons? Were your, you said your parents and your grandma especially were always very supportive when, when you went to them and you said, hey, fam, I'm not going to be a super soccer star anymore. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to do musical theater and I don't really know what I want to do with it. They were like, cool, bro. Like, <laughs> no, they were. And, you know, I had a I had a really awesome teacher who's, like, just, like, one of my favorite people to this day who saw me at that camp and was like, hey, I think you can sing. And so from there, she took me as one of her voice students. And that's when I started training as a singer. And she kind of introduced me to, like, all of these cool new musicals that were happening and taught me about off-Broadway and Broadway and regional and all these things. And so it was through her, her name's Jan Tedesco, that I, like, really got involved with musical theater and then honestly found my voice and my singing ability. So that's how I kind of got into that whole thing, the singing aspect at least. So Shan and Ashley, the two the two people who are responsible for getting you to where you are, <laughs> yes. I guess changing the, the trajectory of your life. Changing it, you know, in the blink of a broken wrist. That's oh, how man. it happened. Yeah. I've never broken a bone, knock on wood, but man, um, like... Yeah, you got off lucky. I, I don't know. I had stitches. I am super like climb on anything, fall and hit my head, but never broken anything. Wow. Yeah. Good, good for you. Yeah. I don't Now I'm just going to knock like, on wood. I'm going to like walk out of this room and slip. And, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, slightly off topic, but yeah. um, researching you on Instagram, you have so many beach pictures. <laughs> How often do you actually go to the beach? Oh gosh, not enough. I w- like maybe like a five days out of the the year, you know, like... You just save them all for, for Instagram, all <laughs> yeah. the pictures. I, yeah, I honestly really do. Yeah, you, you collect your pictures, you post them when you need to post them, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, being on Broadway, we have, we kind of have a relentless schedule. And so you get this, like basically like one vacation a year um, or one every six months, depending. And so 
that's when I can go to the beach. And that's when I really try to go to the beach. And sometimes if it's really cold in New York, I just hop on a flight on my one off day and I will fly to the beach. But yeah, not enough. Fly to the beach? <laughs> yeah. You know, like take like that last minute flight to Miami. Oh man, you're like, you do it upright. You're not going out to like Rockaway or anything. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like Rockaway. But no, I mean like Florida, Florida. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's smart. Yeah, you know, it's it, t- it takes a lot, but it's worth it when you have like a eight show a week schedule, like getting out of here, I think it's very, very important. So I try to do stuff like that on my off days if I can if I can fit it all in. Well, how do you take care of yourself otherwise if you can't get to the beach? Mm, I go upstate. I love upstate New York. And so I go to Woodstock, I go to New Paltz, I go to these places upstate and I just kind of retreat. Like I love like being in the woods. And I think that kind of happened when I was in Michigan, honestly, at boarding school, that I love like seeing the trees and the forest and all that stuff. And so I like to try it and at least like drive an hour, an hour and a half out of the city and just like be quiet and relax. I think it's really important. Yeah, it, it's it's so uh, I guess sensory overload mm, all the time. Like yeah. if, if you're really if you really are mindful and you're really in the moment here in the city, like you you perceive everything. Yeah, and I I totally get that. Like as a performer, um, you know you have to be in touch with yourself and in touch with where you are and everyone around you. That God, it's got to be so draining. Mm-hmm. Like eight shows a week, mm-hmm. and then for the Broadway uh, the the beautiful tour. Right, mm-hmm. you were doing eight shows a week. I was. And traveling. Yeah, and I think like an interesting thing about touring that a lot of people don't realize is that you travel on your off day. So your off day becomes a travel day. And if there's anything anyone knows, it's that traveling is not really that much fun. So, you know, on Mondays, we close a show on Sunday night. We wake up 7 a.m. on Monday, and we'd go to the airport and fly to the next city. So by the time <sighs> we get there, it's like 5 p.m. You know, it's like once you get through your whole day of... Uh, changeovers and all that stuff. You get there at 5 p.m., you like eat dinner, you sleep, and you're back into the show. So yeah, it is, it's a pretty relentless schedule for sure. And then even for the crews too on, on touring shows, because at 9 p.m. you close the show, they've, they're there until the wee hours of the morning, striking the set, yeah, and loading it in the truck. Loading it in, driving they, they it drive all the it. way through. They, they unload on that Tuesday they stay there all day. Uh oh, spilled your coffee. I just spilled yeah. coffee on myself. <laughs> it's going Is there well. A napkin around here somewhere. It's going very well. Oh, well. I don't have any napkins. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is one of those moments we just keep in there because it's fun. Yeah. So yeah, like the crew has it even worse. It's like you know they unload and then they stay through the show. So they have like a dinner break and then they can we start the show and they continue. So you know it's a tough it's a tough business that's for sure. Yeah. I I. Give some. I have so much respect for for traveling shows and especially touring casts because you guys, like you said, on your off days, you really don't get to rest. Mm-mm. You don't get to fly to Miami. You don't get to unless you're performing there, right? But you don't get to sit on the beach, right? And show your ten pack abs. Yeah, but <laughs> one of the fun things that me and my friend Ben used to do when we were really like deep into the tour was we would call. So we'd fly to the, usually I'd like to, you know, you switch planes or whatever on the way. And so during that switch over, we'd call a spa in the town that we were going to and book a treatment, like a massage or a facial or something. So that by the time we arrived, we'd grab our bags, get in an Uber, go straight to the spa and like get our treatments and have like half a day of spa and then like go to bed basically. Oh dude, that that is, you're doing it right. So that's the secret. That's the secret. You're Tra- taking care of yourself Try and obviously out. you got a gym routine. I wasn't joking about those 10 pack abs. <laughs> yeah. For people who, people listening now, go to at uh, Noah J-R-K-T-S on Instagram and check out those abs. Man. <laughs> Asking for a friend. What's your, uh, what's your gym routine? Yeah. What's my gym routine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I'm pretty old school. Five days a week, just be, you know, hit all the muscle groups: shoulders, mm-hmm. back, thighs, abs, legs. That's kind of it. It's yeah, like, there's no secrets to the gym. Well, you're doing you're doing a good job. Oh, thank you. And so now uh, you're in Frozen. Yes. Let's yes. talk about us. Some Frozen. Okay. Um, you originally were with Frozen in the out of town tryout in Denver, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was with the show. We started rehearsing here in New York. I think we rehearsed for about six weeks, and then we took this whole thing to Denver, which was really, really fun. We spent about, I think, about two and a half months there, almost three, yeah, in Denver, starting this thing from scratch. And if there's anything I learned about creating a Broadway show, it is, it is hard, hard work. Yeah. Very well, like hard. what? Well, give me an example of something that surprised you. Well, you know, I think like our show came with a lot of pressure. You know, it's like this huge mega hit movie. And so we had a lot of pressure on us just to get it right. And so I think 
we from the beginning, I think we went through like thirteen opening numbers. Like, and so, yeah, really, yeah. I mean, like vocally changing things, like you know, day after day. So it's like you re- you rehearse a number, it goes in the show that night. You know, changes are made overnight. Basically, they they decide what they want to change. You come in ten a.m. the next day. You rehearse a new portion of the number. That then you go downstairs and through the theater you light it and it's in that night and then the same thing happens. <laughs> you know it continues to happen and happen until they get it right. So this was this was during Denver or were rehearsals here in New York? Uh, mostly during Denver, but wow, yeah. And here in New York, um, we did the we did a similar thing as well. Not nearly as many times, but still definitely just as difficult. That's for sure. So you know, rehearsing a Broadway show and doing the out of town is a lot of fun because you're out of town. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're in Denver, Colorado. What could be better? And we had a lot of fun. We did white water rafting. We did like tubing. We did all the things. Um, but it also it's a lot of it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do 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 you guys ever uh, like mix up what you should be cut or, or what should be in the show and what got cut or you're oh like oh my god oh. yes <laughs> oh my gosh yes <laughs> like honestly the hardest thing for me was the lyrics. We'd switch, we'd, you know, we'd switch the words from like and or but or, you know, we'd change little sections of a full song that we had rehearsed for so long or learned. And so getting those lyrics to write was always a tough one for me. I feel like dance is a little different because you like you got to make sure you're in the right spot and you can rehearse your body and, you know, let your body do the thing. But those words and those lyrics that they change in the opening number in the songs, those were always tricky to catch. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I Gosh, I guess that's a part of your brain that gets developed. You just start... You just start uh, really paying attention to to stuff, but does it make it hard to get in a character or get in the moment when you're like, if I I feel like I would be constantly thinking, oh crap, did they change this? Am I on this track mm. tonight? Or you know, instead of like being the, whoever I'm supposed to be. You know, I think that's like part of the reason why y- y- we don't have we have like a cast of Broadway veterans, and that's that's part of the reason why is because like these people have been through it and they know how to make you think. That they're you know really in it while they're also thinking about what comes next and like that's the true sign of a great performer that they can you know m- not miss a beat like and do this thing that they've never really rehearsed before mm-hmm. and so it's kind of that weird thing of like you know you don't show you don't show it you just smile and you make it work and so we did a lot of that out of town but we made it work and the audiences were happy that's for sure and so you were originally uh, the understudy for Christoph and pa- Pabby right uh, Pabby Pabby yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and who is Pavi for those who don't know? Uh, Pavi is like the grandmaster of what was then in the movie, the trolls. Yes. And so on our show, they're a little different. They're called Hidden Folk. And he kind of is what would be like the grand dome, you know, like the the head of them or, mm-hmm. you know, the grand shaman of the of the trolls or the Hidden Folk. So, um, and now uh, now that you're on Broadway, it's, mm-hmm. it's a month now you've been in for Kristoff full, full time. Yeah. yeah How common is it for understudies to take over the the principal roles? Um, I would say it's not. It's really not that common. You know, it, it's it makes a lot of sense, but I think like a lot of times people take advantage of their Broadway understudies because it's a hard job to do to mm-hmm. cover multiple roles and also be an ensemble member to the you know the best of the, your ability. Is it's a there's a lot of jobs there. And so I think a lot of times a lot of musicals and producers stick to keeping people in their positions because it's a hard spot slot to fill, that's for sure. So I was very honored when um, this whole thing started to come about. Yeah, like when um, we started talking about maybe auditioning for the role again and being considered and having them come see the show. So I was very honored because I I was well well aware that it doesn't happen too often. Right. Yeah, well, I was going to say congratulations because as far as I know, it didn't happen very much at all. Yeah. Um, What was the the original audition process like to get cast in the first place for Denver? And then did you have to audition again to come to Broadway? And then what was the audition process like (laughs) to now get the the role full time? Okay, so we'll start with we'll start with Denver. So actually, even before the Denver production, I auditioned for, you know, there were there were two creative teams for Frozen, right? A different director to choreographer combo for the first, first, first round. And so I actually came in one time while I was on tour for Beautiful for Frozen in New York. I flew in, I had Kristoff material, I had Kristoff sides. And I had to sing my own material as well. And so I did that one time. Um, but the next week, I was scheduled to go on vacation and get those beach pictures. I had a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point in my life, I hadn't been on vacation in, in like two and a half years. I was like touring. I was tired. I was like, I really just, I need this. And I had scheduled it with my friend. He had a crazy Broadway schedule. And I was like, this is the only time. And so, of course, I got a call back. And like, they want to see you this coming week. 
to dance and read and sing. And I'm like, I'm going to be on a boat in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> like right there. You know, of course, it's like a Wednesday. There's no, and there's no flying out from a boat to New York, right, back to a right. boat. So I actually made the decision to pass on the first round. I was like, you know what? If it's meant to be, it will be. Wow. And I'm going to let this one let this one fly. And so that was a really tough decision, but I did. And I'm I'm happy that I did because it worked out well. But I ended that tour. I left. Um, I went to Russia. I came back to the United States. And I was in New York for about a week. And my agent was like, hey, they're still trying to fill one or two tracks for Frozen. Would you be interested? And I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. Let's do it. And so the second round of things was actually very different. Um, it was pretty full on. I was I was there once I started getting going in the real audition and callback process. I was there pretty much every day from like 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it was what's called like work sessions. And, yeah. and, um, and so I was sent like a lot of material overnight. And a lot of the stuff I was doing was actually for the role of Hans and not for the role of Kristoff. Really? Yeah. So I had... A lot of love is an open door. I had like I had to sing that song. I had the scene going in and out of love is an open door. I had Hans of the Southern Isles, which is another song he sings in the show. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of that material, and so I was like, okay, great, you know. And the Kristoff stuff was kind of on the back burner. And then uh, during that week long process of ten to six, um, they sent me some Poppy material as well. And so I was juggling like a lot of characters and a lot of things. And in the meantime, when I wasn't working with the associate director or the casting director. I would then go and dance my face off over at the dance studio right next door. And so it was like, I felt like I was rehearsing for the Broadway show, but without having the Broadway contract just yet. Wow. So you went through all that and with others who I would assume did not get hired. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And it was a long, it was definitely the most extensive process I've ever had for auditioning for a Broadway show. It was, they were really trying to figure out exactly what they wanted and what they needed. And so it all commenced on the final day. And I remember I, I was running late because of train issues, which you know about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, not today, you know, not today. And so I was running late and I ran into the dance studio and I got in the elevator. And of course, I'm like, it's like two minutes until the dance call starts. And I'm jam-packed in a New York City elevator with director, choreographer, music director, music associate, casting. And I mean, we are like sardines in this elevator. And so I'm like, oh gosh, like I know everyone here. What am I going to do? So I started cracking a few jokes. They laughed, which is very sweet of them. <laughs> <laughs> and it you know, ultimately like made me a bit more relaxed going into the dance call because I had seen, I had like these faces. We were like smashed on top of each other. Yeah. And so... I went at the dance call. The dance went well. They paired us up back and forth, back and forth. We did this whole thing. And then finally that ended and they were like, all right, now it's time to sing and dance. And I had like, I I had a folder full of material of just characters of three different characters just ready to do, I guess, whatever they wanted to do. And I had been told in the process like, oh, you know, I don't think the the poppy thing is going to work out. So just, just forget about, forget about that one. I was like, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's like, if they tell you, forget about it, don't forget about it. <laughs> and so I walk into my final and the first thing the director asked for, he's like, so Poppy, let me hear that song. And I was like, mm. <laughs> let me pull that out. Yeah, for let you. me dust that one off. <laughs> so I definitely did. I gave a performance, like, you know, one of those things of like fake it till you make it, sell that thing. And I sold it and it was great. Did a lot more material. And um, I felt really confident in my work just because I had rehearsed this whole week like of and knew exactly what they were looking for. So I felt really good about it. I got on the train, I went home, I got a call as soon as I stepped at my door. That was like, you are in Frozen Musical on Broadway. You're covering the role of Kristoff and you're covering the role of Poppy. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And we took off from there. What'd you do that night or when you got the call? Oh my gosh. I mean, what else do you do? You drink, you go to the bar (laughs) and you celebrate. (laughs) You're like, I'm on Broadway. I'm on Broadway. Heck yeah. Yeah. So you drink and you celebrate and it's always, it's always a great time getting those calls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So you've, you've seen, I guess, a long, uh, long evolution of Kristoff. Yeah. um, Because you've been in in the show for a while and now that it is yours, how, Mm -hmm. what, have you changed anything or are you like... What is the Noah version of Kristoff? Yeah, so I was really interested and I was a little nervous like stepping into this role because I didn't want to do a a reproduced perversion of what Jelani had done. I was Mm -hmm. like, you know, I need to create this thing from the ground up. And luckily the creative team was really, really cool with me starting from scratch, you know, and like 
we re-explored blocking of scenes. We re-explored like acting beats. Um, we we actually re-choreographed a dance break for Kristoff. They were like, we want to use your dance dance ability. Let's let's do a new dance break. So we did that. We explored some new vocal stuff. We did a lot of stuff. And so they really encouraged me to make the material my own and make my Kristoff my Kristoff. And so that was really great. And so I think from that, it's just like once I got that go ahead, I've just been like trying to live in that ever since. It's I think it's a it's a strong testament to to what Disney is is doing, and I, I kind of talked about this a little bit with with uh, Ryan Redmond in the last episode mm-hmm. that you know she's Lady Olaf now you know, mm-hmm. hashtag Lady Olaf because mm-hmm. that's all over Instagram, <laughs> and and like you and Jelani both are are not white, you're not Caucasian, yeah, but. Um, you you did mention a second ago that they were having you read for Hans too, mm-hmm. and I think it it speaks very well to I guess the diversity that's starting to come into casting. And there's no reason why any of this needs to all be what it is. And you know the movie doesn't have to reflect the the show or whatnot, right? Yeah, I think it's really important. And like I remember not too long ago, like a short five years ago, coming to New York. And quickly thinking or realizing that a lot of the shows that I would go in for would just be for black characters, you know? And so now to see this evolution over a short span of time has been really, really wonderful. And it's like, if we can suspend our disbelief to believe a snowman is talking or believe, you know, you know, Elsa can shoot ice out of her hands or this, that, and the other, like, why can't Christoph be black? Why can't this person be a girl? Why can't that person be white? Whatever it needs mm-hmm. to be. But I think the audience is... I mean, that's the true telling point for them. They're still fully in that show. They love it. Every time we come to bow, it's like screams and screams and screams. So that's how I know it's totally fine and we're doing it just right. Yeah. yeah. What's the audience feedback been for you? It's been good. I've had um, a lot of people at the stage door who are repeat repeat offenders. Like a lot, I call them frozen fractals. Like really? in, a, in a month already, you oh, see repeat people. Oh my gosh, yes! And a lot of people who are, have seen me in my ensemble track and then come back again to see my Kristoff, which has been really great. And they've just been really wonderful and really supportive about like we love what you're doing, we love how you sing it, we love your voice and all that stuff. Sending pictures back, taking selfies at the stage door. Tagging me on the Instagram, that good old stuff. So the audience feedback has been has been really great, really really great. That's fun. Do you do you do people take something away from your performance versus uh, like other shows you've been in? Like what what do people walk away from? They're like, man, I love Noah because of this X Y Z. Oh well, I think like one uh, this woman, she like she like broke my little heart at the stage show the other day because she she stopped me and she was like, you know, you made me believe in love again. Oh, I know. She's she was an older lady and she was like, you truly made me believe in love again. And I think if someone, if even one person can take that away from my performance, like that is very moving to me as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. In a parallel universe. You didn't break your wrist. Mm-hmm. And you maybe never got into theater. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What do you think other you is doing right now? Okay. Well, I, t- I, okay. This might sound a little strange, but I always thought I was going to be a plastic surgeon. Really? Oh my gosh. Yes. So I used to be obsessed with that show, Nip Tuck. Uh-huh. Do you remember Nip Tuck? Mm-hmm. It's like so good. And so, and I was like way too young to watch it, but I would sneak and watch watch that. And I would, it just looked so cool. And then, as I got older, I still kept thinking about, oh, I could be a plastic surgeon. And I like wanted to do reconstructive, like burn victims and things like that, like helping people look better, you know, that had gone through traumatic experiences. So that's exactly what I wanted to do. I was like, I'm going to do that. And that's what, that's, I think that's what alternate Noah would be doing. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty noble career, actually. <laughs> okay, so coming back to this universe now, mm-hmm. um, what do you see yourself doing five, 10 or 20 years from now? You know, I've been thinking a lot about that recently, and I'm not sure, but I think like ultimately down the, the my pipeline, I think I'd want to do some more teaching and maybe at the collegiate level, but I, I really do get something so special out of teaching people how to do this because I think musical theater is one of the hardest art forms to get right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you see a lot of, <laughs> you see re- like regional theater sometimes or even high school theater and like, it's just a different experience. So I think it's like, I think there's something to be said about teaching musical theater and how to do it and how to connect to the material on a deeper level. And I think it's a harder art form than people realize. And so I think I would get something really great out of teaching um, college students that. So I think I see that down the line. No TV film or something? Don't you, I think I read something that you've got a little bit of some TV film in the works. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. TV film down the line. But I was that the teaching thing felt like 10, 20. 10, 20. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. But I think next... 
I think it would be nice to to venture into to the TV film land. You know, like that's a totally different art form and a totally different medium that really excites me because I get to relearn and I get to be a new student of something new. So I think it'd be really awesome to do that as well. Do you have anything you're working on now or is it, uh, you're just putting it out there in the universe? <laughs> I'm putting it out there in okay. the universe. I take a lot of class um, in my free time between the shows and, and and it's a lot of fun. I'm really, really enjoying it. And so I'm meeting a lot of people in the, the TV industry now and shaking a lot of hands and doing all of that to set myself up for success. But I think that will be next. Yeah. Well, good luck there. I, yeah. I know um, it's it's a tough business. I, a lot of people like start on Broadway and then they go to TV and film and they make a lot of money and then they come back to, to Broadway yeah. and theater because... Nothing beats live theater. Yeah, I mean, nothing beats like the communal aspect of theater and musical theater and being in a Broadway show. You know, there's something that forces you about being around these people yeah. all the time that makes them truly end up being your family. And I think that's why a lot of people who go away to TV and do their thing come right back. Yeah, yeah, it's a very special place. How, and you said you're taking classes like TV, for TV and film and stuff. Yeah. Do you, do you find it harder? Uh, I guess, to, to maintain a connection and to feel a, a real, I guess, a bond with somebody that you're performing against for TV and film in a scene because it's it's kind of like choppy and broken up because, you know, you're going through like take by take by take. Mm. Whereas on Broadway, like you're on stage with somebody in theory for two and a half hours. Right. I would say, honestly, they're similar in the sense that to you, the audience member, it seems very um, segment, I mean, seems very like flowing and straight through. But for me, I come on, I do, I sit, do my scene, I leave the stage, you know what I mean? And I do whatever I'm doing off the stage. Then I need to pick right back up where I left off and do the next scene. So it actually feels oddly kind of similar, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. 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 And the, if yeah. you ever watch a show and if you're ever, ever able to track just one person in the show, you'll see they leave and mm-hmm. you leave for a certain amount of time. Then they come back and it seems as if they're right back where they, you know, that it never ended, but it actually does. I assume that it's a, just constant costume changes. You're just going back to dressing rooms and yeah, cha- you know, changing your costumes and changing characters. I got lucky with this one. Um, you know, my costume, I, I have two costumes, basically just one sweater change and some some major padding for when I fall through a bridge. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I got pretty lucky. So actually, my, a lot of my time now is not spent changing costumes. So in my original ensemble track, I think I changed like 13 times. Oof. Yeah, I know. Dre- t- dressers are another role, another career. They need their own just, award, that's for my sure. My God, they, they, they keep everybody looking and uh, you know, looking good and keeping them, they, 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 their cues, they don't miss anything. Yeah, it's it is a, its own art form, that's mm-hmm. for sure. It's a special dance. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll wrap up here, and we have three closing standard questions okay. that we ask everybody on the podcast. All First, right. very simply, what motivates you? Mm, what photo motivates me? I think what motivates me is um, is changing people. I, I know that sounds kind of simple, but I think like if I can leave some people change after seeing the show, then I think that's what keeps me coming back the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, and that's what motivates me to come back and keep doing it. Yeah, changing people for the better. Yeah, you seem, you're very into the teaching, the teaching and the <laughs> learning. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's very good. And, yeah. And you can put that out there. You said changing. So is it more of a teaching or it's kind of a side question? Because when you're on stage and you're presenting, you're making people feel, you're yeah. making people experience. Do you want them, do you prefer to have them change and be be left changed through a performance, through watching, or would you rather be teaching? Mm, I think they're two different things. Like, I think they're totally different. If you're coming to watch me in the show, I hope that you're changed because of my performance. <laughs> but if you're coming to take a class, then I think I hope you're changed through my teaching. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But so, I think there's a little bit of both. However they interact with you, yes. That, yes. Yes. You wanted to change people. I get that. Yeah. Okay. Next question. What advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? Mm, just go for it. I would say just go for it. Don't be afraid to fall on your face. Take some risk. Like you only, you'll only be better on the other side. So I would say don't doubt yourself and just go for it. Have you fallen on your face? Yeah. And I think it's really important. I think it's really important. Some of the, the best stuff I've learned has been like failing at school or failing in college or doing things like that. You mean maybe not grade wise, but just performance wise of seeing how things go well or don't go well. And I think that's how you learn and you get better. Trial and error. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Show up and uh, take a chance. Mm-hmm. Yep. And last question if you could only see one show for the rest of your life, what? but you can see it as many times as what? you want. That's hard. What show would you see? Oh my gosh. Where do I even begin? One show. Yep. But you can, can see it as many times as you want. Mm, I think it might be The Color Purple with Cynthia Riva, The Revival. I think that that might be the one I would like to see 
over and over and over and over Fair. Again. All right. Cool? So everybody, you can find Noah online on Twitter and Instagram at Noah, J-R-K-T-S. And uh, we'll find more about Broadway Connection too at broadwayconnection.net. Is there anything anywhere else online you want to plug? Oh, I think that's about it. You nailed yeah. them both. Thank you. Yeah. All right. There you go. And get more of me, theater underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter, facebook.com slash official theater podcast. Listen, subscribe wherever you are now. Rate, review, share, spread the word, help get Noah's story out there. And this is produced by Jillian Hockman. Thanks to our friends Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music. Noah, thank you so much. This has been so fun. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.